action. Hey, what's up everybody? It's your boy Chavis. We at Vibes tonight. Got fish fry. <laughs> got poetry. Now you start saying it. <laughs> got poetry. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm your host. We out here having fun. Come out tonight at 9 o'clock. Uh, the focus of my show is to, you know, have my guest on um, and promote, you know, what they got going on as far as their business, if they're doing comedy, or if they're making mm -hmm. music, if they're a caterer or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And at the same time, uh, we have open discussions about any and everything, you feel me? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I took a look at uh, your IG. I see you, uh, you've been doing comedy for a while now. Um, mm -hmm. let me ask you this. Well, what, uh, what got you into comedy? Um, what got me in was I was, I was, whenever I was a kid, um, I had seen, I came across the, the, uh, I have a tape of the Kings of comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, now I don't, I didn't know what comedy was. Uh, so I should be honest about that. I had no interest in stand up whatsoever because I didn't I didn't know, you know, at that time I was just into video games and, you know, going outside, you know, just being a kid or whatever. By the time I got to sixth grade, I was 11 and and I'll never forget it. We was in the middle of class in September. And this is whenever I started being able to notice how I could make people laugh and how easy it came to me. Mm -hmm. So when I was so during that time in class, I was just like, I want to be a comedian. And I never looked back. So 14, so I'm about in eighth grade. Maybe I was a, yeah I was about I was in the eighth grade maybe like fourteen years old and I didn't get to really do stand up but I was but I was on stage as a host and that was really the first time that I had ever been in front of an audience um, so I was base so you could basically say I've been doing it since I was fourteen years old seventeen I did my first show in uh, twenty sixteen of July which is coming up in two months okay <laughs> and whenever i did and you know um and during the time all i wanted to do was just be on you know comedy clubs or whatever but uh my friend joshua shout out shout outs to him he had <clears throat> he had literally argued me down <laughs> and was like man you just gotta get on stage somewhere you know you gotta you got to be able to get started and i said i didn't want to i didn't want to do it in my hometown of salisbury i just wanted to find somewhere where a comedy club was and get started that way but he was just like you just gotta find a way to get on stage somewhere and do it so i seen that so he tells me that there was an open mic at go burrito and at Go Burrito, that uh, during the time Go Burrito was hosting open mics on Wednesdays, and I think they still do to this day. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna just schedule to do a show that day. Made the announcement on Facebook. Um, hey, I'm doing a doing a comedy show this day, uh, and so on. We get to the day of the show. And I had all of this written material. Now keep in mind, I've never <laughs> done stand up. Like truly had like I was a I had an understanding for it, but I was never a true practitioner of the craft. So, mm -hmm. you know, most comedians when they get on stage, they have an idea of what they want to talk about. I had all of these written things, but it wasn't, but I had never said any of these things in front of a in front of an audience before. So I get in front of the stage. That day it was a packed crowd. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, every, that was there had knew me from high school friends, you know, a little bit of family members. We and I get on stage and, you know, to the to the point of view, you looked at it, it would make it seem like I was having a good show because you had all of these people that were, you know, laughing and everything like that. But really, it was not good at all. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about the show went well. <laughs> In fact, it was so bad. There was a there was a girl that had went to school with me, uh, and I think maybe the next day or it was some, I think whenever we was going back to school because it was during the summertime, she got mad at me and she was like, "I want my two dollars and thirty seven cent of gas." Okay, and, you know, uh, cause nobody, nobody has an understanding of what of what stand up comedy is from from a comedian's perspective is it's different from from a fan because as a fan you feel like because you're funny you go on stage and you know you can and it's like one of the easiest things to do, but really it's not as simple as it is, you know, because when you because once you have a mic. You have to, you actually have to have something to talk about. And me, I had absolutely nothing. You know, people people you know laughing all over the tables and giggling and stuff like that to try to make me feel better. But really, you know, the next day it was just like, right, it, you it, you sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't laughing at your material; they was laughing at you trying to perform comedy, basically. Yeah, it was just trying to, it was just a way of trying to make me feel better. And I caught, and I caught on to it. And I think, I think the comedian that I am now, I would have been able to call them out for it. But because I was just in the moment, you know, I didn't really have an understanding for, you know, the environment and and everything that I was seeing. Um, Then after the show, a friend, a good friend of mine, Lucifer, had talked to me um, after after the show that day, and we were just, you know, he was, just, and he had a better understanding of, of stand up than than what I did at the time, and you know, he was just sitting there talking to me, and he could see something in me that I had not seen in myself yet. I, even during the time whenever he had told me to meet him at the, uh, I forgot what it was, but it's a place in Salisbury. Um, but he told me to go there on a on Thursdays. So, you know, whenever I was working at Sonic, I would leave, I would literally walk from Sonic to there and do, and, you know, do as much stand up as I could. And he would literally get pissed at me. Because he was like, dude, you are so good, but you don't realize how good you are. So it wasn't until I actually started getting, you know, once I moved out of my mother's house, I actually started to get a real un- a real understanding for seeing what stand up, how, how everything operates, how comedians go about doing certain things in their approach to stages before and after shows and whatever <clears throat> and you know now granted um now i've now that i've been able to have a consistency this year compared to back then whenever i was just showing up on stages you know maybe once or twice every year or whatever because i was staying with my mom at the time now that i'm able to go and be in front of crowds it doesn't bother me to bomb as much as it once did Mm -hmm. because i was because i cared so much you know and it's one of those things where you have to care less and just you know you have to be able to have a have a love for the craft 
Okay. So essentially, uh, you coming out there, I think you said you was 14, correct? Starting out, mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't know how to structure your jokes. You didn't have a rhythm and you didn't have your timing down. And, you know, it's it's rookie mistakes. It happens. You know, I, I mm-hmm. spoke to and I know uh, a lot of comedians and I mean, you always look at it like it's easy because you can make your homeboys laugh or your friends or a random stranger by saying some stuff, you know, on the whim. But to control a crowd and, you know, get that timing down and have them laughing and, and being able to expect a certain reaction to a certain punchline and everything, it takes time to take practice. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, I mean, I, I'm glad that you see it now and then you're taking it more seriously because that's how you you reach that upper echelon. And then next thing you know, you, you're going to see Chavis, the comedian, up on uh you know, Jimmy Kimmel or something like that. You feel me? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's 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 been it's been a crazy it's been a crazy time. You know, like when well, because in the year twenty twenty, I wanted to. That's whenever I wanted to really truly get back on stage, but I couldn't because pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. So um, December, I had. It was like at the end of the year, around 2020, maybe maybe the beginning of 2021. I went to go see I went to go see Ryan Davis, um, and for the, I don't know if anybody knows who Ryan Davis is, but Ryan is uh, famous out of famous comedian out of North Carolina, uh, Con- Concord, I think. So I talked to so I talked to him. And he was just telling me, you know, you have to be able to get on the ground running this year and truly get on the mics. So now I literally go on go on stage as much as I can. And it's a and now it's a different feel for me because now I don't care if I do bad. Mm-hmm. I will literally call, I will literally call it out. And tell people, if I die, you die with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's just and you know, people and people think that when you bomb is always you did a bad you had a bad night, which is not really the case. Sometimes you can make the crowd laugh, but your but the material that you're working on is not quite there. I have nights like that. Like technically, I've been bombing for three months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I haven't. So I haven't gotten where I needed to be yet, and I and I'm cool with that because I know that there's so much time left. And you know, one of the things that Ryan was explaining to me is that for all the years that you've been that you've been learning about stand up. You have to unlearn it. And so what I did was I went, and this was after the third show that I had bombed. Because the first show, I was just now getting back on stage. And this was, and I was doing a show with uh, my friend Mookie, Ethan Peace, and and Zach Johnson. And Zach was the headliner. Now, um, whenever we had scheduled to go to the show, Beforehand, I literally locked my keys in the, the keys in the house, mm-hmm. so I did not get it. So I had to call a locksmith that night to come and lock the door just for me to try to get to the show. Done. I got there late, and as soon as I got there late, show was literally about over. And once the show and uh, Zach had performed, so he was the headliner, and they had asked me. They was like, "Hey, do you still want to go on?" And I said, "Yeah, I will." And that was a mistake. <laughs> 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 I should have just—I probably should have just went home because, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to follow up after a headliner, but don't do it. <laughs> just, just take my advice and don't do it. If you're late to a show, you got to follow up after the headline. Just go home. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> Because they, because a headliner's job is supposed is to close a show, 
So wherever they leave out on top, and if you suck and you can't follow up after that, it's no point. <laughs> I couldn't follow up after that, and I was literally on stage trying to tell a joke, didn't work, and I was getting I was getting roasted from a from an audience member. I couldn't even roast I couldn't even roast with him because I knew <laughs> I had already lost. <laughs> like I was already doing that. I was. I wasn't about to add on to that. And my friends was like, yo, like, bro, are you are you okay? I was like, hey, it's like, nigga, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you want me to do? I, I'm cool with that, you know? Just, so that so that was the first night. Second night, there was another, so there was another show. Uh my boy Ethan um was doing the Laugh Now Cry Later. Comedian uh, Just Berkby from Wild and Out was whole, was the headliner for that show. Now, for some time, I had I know I had been on stage a little bit, but I was but still again I was not there yet. And whenever I had to follow up after him, well, I didn't have to follow up after Berkby, but um, but even had not told me how much time. I was supposed to be trying to work with. So literally during that time that I was on stage, it looked bad because I didn't know I was doing five minutes. Otherwise I would have had had different setups for it. But you know, this nigga had flat when <laughs> when you had a show in the comedian and somebody flashes a light, that means that you have at least about one minute left before you have to get off the stage. Mm -hmm. So he flashes the light at me. And I'm sitting here looking at the light, like, huh? <laughs> Confused, didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Got off, and then, you know, he took the microphone for me. I got off stage, and then Burby goes on, and he thrashes me for like the first five minutes of the show. <laughs> he was like, he was like, hey man, give it up for him. He said, yeah. You know, it's hard for comedians to do a show, um, let alone just do the craft in general. But I got some advice for you. Go home and write you some jokes, nigga. And then that's whenever he went into his own. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just gonna say like third and then third night after, and then after that night, I was just like, I had the I had to talk to Ryan and ask him what was happening. And then that's whenever he had, you know, that's whenever he had helped me out. Ryan Davis is a funny dude. I would call him a uh a brilliant uh I guess you could say satire comedian, but his views and opinions on top of uh his comedic geniuses, uh very different and that's what puts him you know in the position he's in right now because at at first i didn't know he did stand up i just i seen him on facebook doing like you know the side by side videos and it was always funny and he will always get big comments big likes and stuff like that so that that would made me follow him so you know i saw him uh do a stand up i think it was on the keep your distance comedy show or oh, am i mistaken um it was somewhere in the last six months and i was like okay so he he's dope on stage not just you know what i'm saying uh social media wise so that's what's up i'm assuming um you're in north carolina where he's from right mm -hmm. okay you say you're from salisbury mm -hmm. so officially how long have you actually been doing stand-up so officially now um if you want to if you want to take if you want to put in the uh since i've been doing it for four uh since i was 14 it would be set it would be seven years this going for this year but i since i cut all of that out i've just really just been treating this like it was year one so for me it's really just been it's just been months in in my mind for me because when you have a when you have a consistency that's real i feel like when when you have a consistency doing something 
that's really the only time that you can say that you've really been doing it. You know, mm. to say that, you know, you've been, it's like, if I'm a, if I'm a rapper, I can't, and I'm coming out with a song, you know, January, and then decide to come, come out with another song the next year in August. And I can't really call myself a musical artist. I'm just, putting out a song. <laughs> so for me, I couldn't I couldn't really say that I was doing stand up until now. Okay. So you was you was tiptoeing with it. You was you putting your tip you was putting your foot in sometimes and then you would take it back out because I guess you wasn't too confident. Did did you ever feel like um even though you was trying like you was hesitant to get back out there because you was getting booed or you wasn't getting the type of uh you know what i'm saying responses that you initially wanted or you would hope to have no it wasn't it wasn't that like during the time that i was living with my mother i didn't have a way to get on this uh to go to attend shows whenever i wanted to mm-hmm. so I felt like the best time for me to, the only time I could do that was to get out from under my mom. When I did, then that's whenever I could find a consistency with doing it. Now, granted, 2020 was the, you know, COVID-19 and everybody was shut down. Mm-hmm. But the beginning of this year is whenever I was able to start getting into everything again. So whenever I went to go see Ryan at the uh, Greenville Comedy Zone in South Carolina, I had seen that they had been doing, that they do open mics every Thursday, um, pretty, pretty much every Thursday. So I had been going there, you know, every single Thursday since this year, as much as, um, during that during this year to be on stage Mm -hmm. now compared to those other times it's been a weekly basis and i've been able to understand everything a lot more better and if i'm in my confidence level now is a lot more different because when you end up because in the beginning there's a lot more that you care about you know you care whether you do well or and whether you do bad you know you know you don't know that and you feel like if you screw it up you don't know if you'll get this opportunity again it's just it's just all kinds of stuff that goes into it so a part of you it's like a part of you has to take that part of you has to die and the new part of you that has to that has to get there is the fact that you got to be able to say, you know what, if I do bad, if I do good, it doesn't matter. But you still got to try to do your best, the best that you can at that time. Okay, so understanding that um, the less you care, the easier it is for you to sort of relax and go out there and. Mm-hmm perform to the best of your ability or, you know, give yourself the freedom to be creative, Mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, that's always a good uh, perspective to think about things with. So, so last year when you wasn't able to do stand up, what did you do? Like, um, did you transition into, you know, social media or did you try to, you know, sharpen your skills another way or did you, you know, pick up a new skill? during your time where you couldn't get on stage so during the so during the time that i that i didn't that i wasn't on stage all i did was just pretty much just watch i was between watching comedians and writing and it gave me a different and it gave me a perspective to understand okay these are the things that's going on in I guess it gave me a different look to how comedy is approached. And you get to see how the different times have changed, especially on the cancel culture level Mm -hmm. or 
a sensitivity level, how everybody is so sensitive with everything. And, you know, I see and I've seen comedians that have gotten to a point now where they care about the things that they say because of the position that they're sometimes either the position that they're in or they just don't want to risk the chance of having to deal with that, you know. And as far and as far as social media goes, I'm not even a tech a tech circuit person. Like I hate being in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really I really do. Like uh, if somebody uh, I will I will take pictures with people, but as far as trying to take a picture with myself, I will not do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that that sounds like something you're gonna have to work on because you know you want to get out there, mm -hmm. and you know it's it's a new day and age. Like you know, uh, information and technology is jumping every day, and that's that's essentially where everything is going to. Like this conversation, man, you having, you know, this is this is gonna be the new normal. This is how you're gonna you know send in your reels, especially if you want to do auditions or you know try to you know, uh, go from, uh, you know, being a comedian to an actor. Not that I know that that's what you want to do, but those those opportunities happen from you taking advantage of, you know, all the technology that's around you. So, you know, you might want to look into that, you know, <laughs> you know, just in case. I mean, right now, you know, it, uh, this, this setup that I got going on, this took a while for me to get used to. But we here now, we having this conversation. So, you know, pretty soon, you know, you might you might forget that. It's almost like uh when you first got on stage when you was fourteen, I'm pretty sure you had stage fright. Now you don't have stage fright, you more focusing on whether your material was landing or not, you know? Yeah, oh no, to be honest with you, I was never I was never scared to be in front of people though. The that's one thing I found I found weird about myself. Like if I I feel like for me, if I'm in I feel a lot better just being just being in front of people because I think that's where I'm most comfortable. I don't um I think that because because of that freedom of expression, I get to it's it's fun for me. It's uh it's therapy, basically. And I get to be a lot more comfortable with that, you know. And I think that once I'm at a certain level in my career, uh, I just the one the one thing for me is I don't want to get to a point where if I I feel like if I have to give up that part of my existence the the artistic freedom of of that part then i don't i probably wouldn't try to involve myself with too much because i think the more you try to get yourself involved in you know the less the less control you have i understand uh freedom of expression is a big part of you know uh, being an artist on the platform that you're on. So having those handcuffs, you know, make you want to, you know, switch it up. But unfortunately, um, due to PC culture, you got to, you got to shift. You got to, you know what I'm saying? You got to step your game up. And basically you can say just about what you want. You just got to find a way to say it without it coming out uh being harmful you know it can impact somebody greatly just as long as it's not in a negative way you feel me mm -hmm. yeah that now that part i think it's all i think it's always pretty much been like that um i just think now um it just it really it really just it really just all depends on uh on who you are some people some people can i mean at at this at this day and age, some things just get taken too far. As far as someone is just wanting to cancel you just to just to be a hater, mm -hmm. 
And then other times they can do it, they can do it for the right reasons. Like, uh, so <laughs> with, so with R. Kelly, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. So, let's see what you got to say about him. <laughs> we know what R. Kelly is as an artist. It will, <laughs> You, there's just I think as a musician as an art as an artist, there's nothing that you can do to take that away from him. Mm-hmm. Then there's <laughs> then there's him and and little girls. You know, yeah. <laughs> you just. It's just like you just juggling in between which which R. Kelly which R. Kelly you want to like and and dislike. I mean, of course, I lo- I love R. Kelly as an artist. If I hear one of his songs, I'm gonna sing it. But I still know that you did what you did, and I'm like, man, eh, you know. But you still R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> the way I see it is. Um there's no two r kelly's you know uh because you're still you know you're still a a great producer and a great vocalist or whatever songwriter but you have that that side of you you know what i'm saying so Mm -hmm. you can you can split it down the middle it's still coming from the same person you feel me Mm -hmm. so he's he he still makes you know oh he still made you know, great hits like I Believe I Can Fly and Step the Name of Love and, you know, all that other stuff. But at the same time, when he put the uh, microphone down, he went and did him. And unfortunately, what he did was was messed up. So you got to mm-hmm. always consider that no one's no one's perfect. You know, if that was the case, we wouldn't have that situation. And for real, for real, if you think about it, if everyone was perfect or if you had a bunch of people going around, you wouldn't get funny stuff that happens like, you know, people falling down the steps or, you know, flipping over bike rails or trying to jump over fences and clip, you know, those great YouTube videos that make you laugh on a daily basis. So you got to you got to look at it like that, you know, regardless to what everyone says or what anyone thinks, no one's perfect everyone should stink. And if yours don't, I, I suggest you go to the doctor. Yeah, you can't, like, man. <laughs> I've made, I've made people walk out on, on my shows. <laughs> I've, I've done it. <laughs> but I've never came, I've never came from, the thing is for me, I've never came from a bad place. I was just, I was just making an attempt. So all I can say, I, I the the one thing about comedy is that it's not supposed to feel good. It people don't understand that for us, everything that we're talking to you about, it hurts. Like we hurt, it hurts for us just as much to deal with it than to and and feel comfortable talking about it. Because the thing about it is, it's like to have an artistic expression about something, especially knowing that you have to find a way to be able to cope with this. Because we're, because to be honest with you, you know, as human beings, we're, we're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> hey, look. You ain't you ain't never lied about that. Like people are trash. People people are trash. So comedians, from from my experience and from what I I've heard them say, is that they can take a tragic moment and turn it into a great story or a great joke. And a lot of people can relate to those things, and that's what makes it so great and humorous. Because you told a story about you know, um, you wrapping your car around a tree or um, someone trying to stab you and made people laugh at it, you know? So 
yes, you know, at that at that time, because think about it, if you couldn't get past that moment, you wouldn't talk about it on stage. So you found a way to make it humorous enough. You know, you heal from it. You wasn't you wasn't happy at first, you know, when it was happening or, you know, sometime after that. But after that, after you were ready to talk about it, you was like, I got to tell somebody this. Not only do I have to tell somebody this, I got to make them see the humorous side to the shit, you know? So, you know, that that's the way I think most comedians approach it. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I get that asshole line so much. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the guy to a point where it's hilarious to me. Like, uh, like my, my homeboys, it's, and I don't know what it is, maybe... <laughs> Is the I always get that I always get that especially between me and women it it never goes good <laughs> and my and my friends would be like bro you're you're an asshole like you your level of honesty you you should never be that honest <laughs> <laughs> but I can't but I can't help it like I know. He, he, the the one thing that I could never do is I could never ball up something inside long enough. I suck at it. If I ball it up, especially a feeling or anything like that, I am going to break down easily because mentally I am not set up that way to be able to cope with something like especially depending on what the level of it was to hold it in you know for that long especially it would be like somebody holding a grudge because they punched you in the face and you never got the chance to get them back i'm not one of those guys <laughs> <laughs> i <laughs> i literally have to find a way to talk about it I don't care if it's in front of one person or if it's in front of a hundred people, but if I can get the chance to talk shit, I'm going to do it. I, I just, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. So like you stated earlier, you're using the stage as a form of therapy and to get those emotions out because keeping it in you know it uh it's not healthy number one and and two it'll turn out bad for you if you um you know let it out in the wrong place or at the wrong time but the being an asshole thing is something you gotta work on that's that's like you taking the coy hokum approach <laughs> you know say to comedy I, like i i mean i can't i mean man look if, if i could deal with if i could be a a healthy happy individual and not be an asshole about about things man i probably wouldn't be doing comedy mm -hmm. <laughs> but but because i am literally so bad at it you know you couldn't there's not like people could come to me about a serious situation 95 percent of me is comedian the other five percent is sympathy so somebody coming to me about a, a serious situation they'll be <laughs> there could be something in your in your expression or your voice or it could be some it could be the way that i see it in my mind where i will laugh at it because i could never because i think if i try to take something too serious i'm just it's like you don't want to i don't want to be that emotional so if somebody comes to me about it i will i'll understand <laughs> but then let me tell you why this is funny to me hmm. <laughs> so i don't okay so um at this point it, it sounds like you um you got your head on straight when it comes to knowing who you are and knows what that's going to bring you um you're uh 21 22 22 22 so i'm gonna tell you right now as a former 22 year old 
Um, you got a lot of growing up to do, not saying that you're immature, but that you don't have enough life experience to know what's what yet. And I'm not telling mm -hmm. you I know what's what. I'm telling you what I thought I knew at 22. And I'm pretty sure you think in the same way. And, you know, just for, you know, safety reasons, I suggest you find a way to control the assholeness because not everybody, not everybody's going to think it's funny. <laughs> and, and you might catch them on the wrong day at the right time. You feel me? So mm -hmm. I, if you're going to keep doing it, I, I suggest you, <laughs> you hit the gym and, and get your boxing skills up because they coming. They coming. <laughs> I've been, uh, I remember one time <laughs> somebody got, it was somebody that got so mad at me. It was like, it was like, man, you gotta, you gotta apologize for that. I was like, I, I can't do it. <laughs> and then, but see, the thing is, when I come, I come from a good place whenever I do it. So I know, I recognize the, the place and the time for, the place and the time for certain things is, but um, I think that if someone was to try to come to me about trying to apologize, it's funny because the time that I've tried to apologize, and it's not me really apologizing, it's just me saying sorry so we can just move past the situation. So whenever I have apologized before, somebody will literally turn around and do the same thing <laughs> <laughs> and it was and it was the person that wanted me to apologize about it you know people are hypocrites <laughs> so it so it's like i can if i'm if i'm apologizing just make sure that you're not doing what i called you out for and we'll be fine but if you're doing it if <laughs> you're still doing it, I'm like, what was the point of me apologizing? I don't, I don't know about that one. That's <laughs> that's that's wild in my opinion, man. I, um, yeah, uh, hypocrites get on my nerves, so I try not to let they be as good to me. But at, you know, at the same time, it's like. If you want to play that game, I'll show you I can play it too. And not only can I play it, I can do it better than you. You know, mm -hmm. so that I, I I can see I can see uh, where you're going with that, and and that's why you keep it going. It's like, hey, if if everyone's going to play, you know, why not me? You know, don't 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 leave me out the game. You know what I'm saying? I like games too. So. Yeah, cool. It's you could call you could call me out on on my BS, and I'm and I'm cool with it. I'm just saying, if I if I call you out, <laughs> you just you just got to be like, all right, that's all I need from you. I'm, all right, and we cool. <laughs> so uh, I see you uh, you ran into uh, Dio Hughley, man. How'd that happen? Uh, I was at his show. Um, I think he's working on. He's probably working on another hour right now. Um, cause whenever I went to the show, he probably did maybe 30, 40 minutes of material. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I, so, I, so when I got to the show, he was, he, he had not performed yet. So, um, well, the show actually haven't even started. So I had to, you know, and this is my first time ever being at a select, like a true celebrity show. So when I go in, it's packed. And I'm like, I don't even know where the hell I'm going to sit. But I ended up having to sit at the same spot where he had to come through to get to the stage. So when I seen him, it did not seem real. Hmm. <laughs> and keep in mind, these were... He was the first, him and the, you know, the, the Kings of Comedy were the first people that I had watched doing stand up. So seeing somebody that you have been watching for years, it doesn't, it doesn't seem real to you. It would be like a basketball player. You know how basketball players talk about Michael Jordan and 
how he's like um they they call him black jesus <laughs> yeah it was it was like that it was like that for me as a comedian because when i because seeing because seeing a man especially doing what he does at the level that he does it you know it it does not come too often <laughs> So he walked. So when he walked past me, I was looking like this nigga. <laughs> I'm talking. I'm talking security guards and everything. I'm like, yo, what the fuck am I? <laughs> and he goes past me, man. I was. I forgot. I forgot about that comedy show at that at that moment. And. Um, and then after the and then after the show, he was he was in the in the room, you know, just I guess chilling, waiting on waiting on his next show. And I just asked the I just wanted to get a picture, so I got you know, so I got a picture with him, and I and I left. And I wish I could have I wish I could have talked to him because I would have told because I would have told him, but I was like, but he was already talking to somebody, and I'm not really sure. Um, you know, but Nate, but I believe that there will be another chance that I really do get to sit and talk to him. But at that moment, it I like to say is that it, that it just didn't seem real, and he just made he just made stand up look so effortless. Yeah, he he's tried and true and polished, man. He's one of my he's in my top five of comedians, and. Uh, just depending on you know what he's talking about he's always going to make that shit seem so funny and relatable like I remember one time uh, I think he did a set like back in 2006 and he was in DC and he was talking about uh, typhoons and he was saying if you go to the beach and the beach ain't there it's time for you to leave like (laughs) <laughs> and he was like white people he was like white people stay there and they get mad and like they they, they got the audacity that i have the beach oh here it comes <laughs> <laughs> that shit that shit was dumb funny man i uh I, i'm 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 glad i talked about that because i'm gonna watch that special uh when i get off here come to think about it man that dude is wild no, uh, uh, the one one comedian that I had really, it was it's two it's two comedians that I really that I really started to watch the most. One being Dave Chappelle, and another one being Patrice O'Neill. Okay, but between those two, those are the main guys that I have watched for. Like I think ever since Dave came came back. Mm-hmm. Um, from from the time of from his time in SNL, uh, especially, and then the four well not four but uh, the five specials that he's done, you know, because I didn't I didn't watch, you know, I to be honest I didn't watch Dave Dave, Dave Chappelle at an earlier at an earlier point in his career. One, I wasn't I wasn't even old enough to know who he was, mm-hmm. but. You know, now that I that now that I truly watch comedians now, I know I'm aware of the comedian that he is now. And everybody has talked about the space that he's in as a comedian. It's it's different. And then Patrice just being who Patrice is with his especially when he came out with the elephant in the room when you watched the special you could definitely see that had he had more time on this on this earth he probably would have been in that top five conversation of greatest of all time mm-hmm. and say same thing about uh robin harris you know mm-hmm. uh, he was the an animal at his time and then uh bernie mac you know, right when it seems like for some reason, when you got a, a, a caliber of talent like that and, uh, you know, 
at least for the black people um, that we're discussing, for some reason, man, they get taken too early. And it's like, wow, I would have I really wanted to see this progress and, and see where it, you know, what could have happened because, you know, I look forward to the day. I know it can't be redone, but, uh, you know, like a different version of like Harlem Nights. Harlem Nights was classic and it can't be replaced. It can only be, it can either be matched or outdone. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> there, there hasn't been a, a collaboration of funny like that. I would say since I'm going to get you sucker and um, I can't really think of another another project outside of the Wayans collective that that kind of matched that that level of comedy. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's a lot of great people out here putting out great content. But, you know, that that time and place with that cast, all them stars with Della Reese stole the show. You know what I'm saying? For the, all those comedians, you can't you can't beat it. Yeah, it's 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 definitely hard to to know, um, especially with the collectives of comedians nowadays, because there because there are so many. But I think. As far as the times nowadays, there's so many comedians, but the ones that are truly at the epitome of what we know as stand-up comedy, it's a it's a slim list. I think maybe Chris Rock, Kevin Hart, Dave, Dave Chappelle, um, Jerry Seinfeld are probably the only four comedians that I can think of that are probably at the at the height of comedy right now but the i think as far as stand-up dave is in the best space for for a comedian and you know chris and then i think and chris rock and his and i think right now with chris rock he's he has a look at stand-up comedy where he has definitely has a perception of breaking down things and just his his philosophical look at subjects, especially um, whenever he came out with Tambourine, mm-hmm. is you know you you get amazed at it. Yeah, uh, Chris Rock is one of those dudes that his voice makes you want to pay attention to him and he's always moving and he's making you follow him so when you follow him like when you're watching him on stage or in a movie or whatever you know what i'm saying you follow him every word he says along with his movements so he's got the voice he's got the he's got the the wit and then he'll just fuck you up with a crazy ass facial expression and you'll be like man this motherfucker is stupid you know what I'm saying? So that's that's what, you know, the first time I ever saw him or anything when I was a kid was CB4. It wasn't until years later when I seen, um, uh, what was it, Bigger and Blacker? Or, nah, the one he did in D.C. I can't think of the name of it right now. Kill the, uh, Kill the Messenger. No, no, that was, that was after that. Um, um. I'm trying to think of the, the first one he did on HBO. And I know he did like the first two or three in DC, but it was it was funny as shit. And that's and every year or every time he did a special, um, when he dropped it, it was always um, consistent in elevation. So it wasn't like the same thing. He, you know, I'm not saying he had the same subject matter, but it was a elevation in his comedy. Uh, funniness every special he did in my opinion so as he matured his talent matured and you know for a while uh he was that dude i mean he even said it like him him and Chappelle, like you said him and Chappelle, uh they on that same uh plateau and it's like they button a and b you know i'm saying the same side of you know uh the different sides of the same coin in my opinion you know, when it comes to that level of talent, 
the time in the game and the respect amongst other comedians. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. Ke- Kevin Hart, everyone's saying that he's reached that plateau. Um, uh, who else? Um, uh, Steve Harvey, um, uh, Trust Tide and, and True, you know what I'm saying? Like people like that. So when you when you think about it, you're trying to achieve a legendary status, you know what I'm saying? Because these people that you look up to, the people that you respect, the people that you watch, right? Uh, you hope to uh, one day emulate what they did and from your perspective. So seeing as though you started all over, what are the steps you're going to take now going forward when it comes to, you know, upgrading your skill set and comedy? Uh, where I, where I look to right now is I look to be in a space where I don't have to, I don't have to look back and feel like there was something that I could have said better. Every time that I have a subject about something. I have to come from an artistic standpoint and well, not artistic, but an articulate standpoint about something. When I'm doing stand up, it's never about a joke, but more so about a level of interest because Um, The one thing I understand about being a comedian is I will put being being interesting over being funny. And it's not to say, and of course, as as a comedian, it's your job to make people laugh. But I think when you have love, when you are interesting, you, you come from a different standpoint to those that just want to have the joke about something. You know, like when, okay, so for instance, when Ryan Davis does a side by side, it's mm-hmm. never, it's never about a joke. He has a point of view about something that he's talking about on the other side of it. Like when he did the, uh, the Derrick Jackson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Each point, each video that he does, he has a point of view about it. He's not just coming out with the, he's just he's not just coming out with different different videos. He was like, the only way that I'm going to talk about a video is if it interests me. And now he has uh, the Kevin Samuels video. Um, I think he just put he he put out the part one, and now he's having a part two, but when he does it he has a he has a point of view about it so now from so for me as a stand-up if i'm going to talk about something that normally doesn't get talked about from it could be stand-up it could be <laughs> it could be rape it could be <laughs> it could be uh yeah. this, <laughs> it could be uh, <laughs> police brutalities with well, everything going on mm-hmm. it's not you know I'm very I'm very selective about the way that I'm going to talk about something because I have to have a point of view about it I couldn't just come out with a joke like anybody else I have to have a point of view otherwise I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about it just yet. It, I, it's it, it takes time for me. Okay, so you don't stray away from touchy subjects. You just you you. Uh, I don't want to say you take what's on your mind, but something that interests you that you will want to you know elaborate on or express through a joke. You want to try it and. You're going to try not to be an asshole about it, but sometimes that filter just rides on through your writing or, you know, your form of expression, I could say. Now, the 
<laughs> well, well, let me elaborate on it. The asshole part of it is just so I don't have to have feelings towards it. I understand the the sympathy in what that subject is. Mm-hmm. The asshole part of it is to make sure that I don't have to sit there and be like, well, if I if I talk about it, I wonder how people would feel. And so I don't care how you feel <laughs> about it, but to make sure that when I, but that as I'm talking about it, I'm talking about it. I don't have to be like, well, you know what, man, if I, if I say this, I know, I know people are going to, are going to feel some type of way about it. I'm like, now nah, I'm just going to say it. Okay. So you figured out a way to um, not hinder yourself by letting that part go. And now you, you know, getting to a point to where you're going to be comfortable on stage and make that happen because, you know, that's all that you could do is practice. Um, have you decided to uh, try getting out of your own city and doing stand up other places once you? you know, uh, I guess have the time or have the opportunity. Yeah, I will do, I will do stand up wherever the, wherever the opportunity presents itself. I think the most, the the place that I usually go out of state is uh, South Carolina and the, um, and the Greenville comedy zone to do, to do stand up. But other than that, um, it's just pretty much between there and, and here for right now until, until I, get to that point where people actually want me to be out in these different areas or I just go out myself. Okay. Yeah, man, you gotta, you gotta put yourself in different situations in front of different crowds because, you know, that's going to sharpen your skills. Number one, two, it's going to give you, you know, different perspectives on comedy and, and three, when you broaden your horizon, you can see, um, you know, what's ahead of you. So not only will you put yourself in a situation to, you know, better your craft, you'll make some contacts at the same time and they'll be able to put you on with, you know, gigs or whatever opportunities you could take advantage of in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So other than that, um, you got anything, any new shows coming up like in uh, the next month or so? So um, next month I'll be working on going back to going back to Salisbury to uh, and I'm not really sure about the details about that because I'm be honest when when it comes to me playing the shows I'm bad at it <laughs> 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 I just go along with it so you know I just be like oh well you got a show okay cool um, and you know th- these things come last minute with me but with that being said. June, we're working, I'm working on a date for June 10th um, in in Salisbury. Other than that, I'm pretty much just figuring out who's doing what, where, and just going there. Okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, uh, this this has been dope, man. Um, I appreciate you hitting me up, wanting to get on the show, and I like your story, man. It's um, it's a, it's a, it's a real, um, it's a real honor to hear it. To be quite honest, because not a lot of people, you know, talk about that. They like to just, you know, hit the highlights of what they did and not really talk about that, that truth. You know, you speaking about uh, the therapeutic side of, of comedy for you and you know, bombing for the last three months consistently, apparently, you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't hear that often, but you know, at the same time, it, it's the truth and that's what makes it funny. And that's what makes it real. So, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna wrap things up, but, uh, once I, once I do that, I'm gonna talk to you, uh, off air about all something. Right. All right. So, um, once you, uh, let the people know where they can find you at, man. So, um, everybody, you can find me at Instagram, Chavis, C-H-A-V-I-S underscore Lipscomb. 
L-I-P-S-C-O-M-B, uh, Snapchat. I'll figure that out later. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook, you can find me at Chavis Maurice Lipscomb. I have three different Facebooks, but uh, just send a friend request to all three, and <laughs> you'll you'll figure it out. <laughs> and you just follow my page at uh, Chavis the Lipscomb C H A V I S L I P S C O M B, um, and that's on Facebook. Okay, okay. I'll make sure I'll get uh, links to all your social media, and I'll put them in the description uh, of this episode. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that has been Chavis Lipcomb. Why don't y'all give it up for him? <laughs> uh, I have been your host, the Landover Legend, aka Big T, and this has been another dope installment of the I Can't Make This Up podcast. That's I Can't with a K Make This Up podcast. You can find this podcast everywhere they're available. Also find me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And if you're listening to this, I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to listen very closely. If you watch my video, you better hit that damn like button or at least subscribe or follow on Spotify, Apple, Twitter, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, and all those places that you're listening to me right now. Because uh, all that counts. So don't just be looking low in on my uh, channel. And thank you and all that good stuff. <laughs> Until next time, peace. <laughs>